Hello my friends, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu and this video you are watching is the fourth of what I call my opinion videos. As you know, the main purpose of my YouTube channel is to explain the rules of heavy games. But not just any heavy games, only those games I call immersion games. And since I'm well aware that these games are not very widespread, and that I have a big job ahead of me just to make them known and get people to want to play them, I've decided to devote special videos, those famous opinion videos, to explaining what I'm talking about, what immersion games are, why I like them so much, and why these games are so important and even necessary to our gaming landscape. And first of all, if you didn't get anything from my intro, I suggest you watch my first three videos which introduce the topic, that is, what are immersion games, how do they literally tell stories, and what are the main categories of immersion games on the market. Here we go, and so today, fourth episode, I must keep my promises and talk about a tricky matter, the comparison between immersion games and role-playing games. Because yes, I know, I keep telling you that in games I'm looking for immersion, the exploration of new worlds, the identification with a fictional character, and of course, you should say, hey, Jean-Michel Grosjeu, I know exactly the kind of games you are looking for, Role-playing games, of course, because frankly, there's no better way to immerse yourself in a distant world or another era through the eyes of an imaginary character. Mm, no, I don't quite agree, and that's why I need this video to explain my point of view. Immersion games, that is, board games with cards and tokens, allow an immersion that role-playing does not. That's it. That's what I think, and now I'll take the time to talk about it. Fine, but before going on, let me be clear at the outset. Don't expect me to trash role-playing games. I've been a fan of them since I was a kid, starting with the very first edition of Dungeons & Dragons, which I picked up when it came out in stores. And it's been a long time because this year marks the 50th anniversary of its release. Role-playing games are obviously immersive storytelling games. But as I explained in a previous video, there's no simple direct line from abstract to immersion games that could be extended to the absolute ideal of role-playing. It's not as simple as that. Role-playing games are neither better nor worse than immersion games. They are just different. And that's what we are going to talk about now, the differences between role-playing and immersion board games. And here is how I'm going to do. I'm going to give you four examples of how I think immersion board games are more realistic, more immersive, more compelling and even more memorable than role-playing games. Of course, there are other cases where the opposite is true, but that's not what I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to present four cases where immersion games are indeed better than role-playing games. But that doesn't mean that role-playing isn't interesting. It's just that for the time of a video, I'd like to focus on immersion games. And I'm going to use some specific examples, of course, some specific games. And that's important too, because never forget that I'm not talking about all board games. I'm only talking about immersion games. Don't tell me that Scythe or Dune Imperium, for example, immerse their players in a wonderful world, because they don't. These games are Euro games, heavy on mechanisms. They prioritize game mechanics over storytelling. To put it plainly, they are not welcome on my channel. So, first example, first point of comparison, what I might call with a little drama, the fear of death. Let me explain. 
I'm a paladin in a game of Pathfinder, the well-known role-playing game from Paizo. Around the table, players start by spending a few hours making their character sheets. Then the game master gives us our mission. And off we go, right into the action. As a proud paladin, I lead my companions to a lonely cave. We hear suspicious noises. It sounds like a very large animal. Oh my god, it's a dragon. This is what I call a spectacular and memorable intro. We are about to fight the monster and... I have to be honest with you, even though I don't know what's going to happen, I feel pretty cool because I know, deep down inside, that my chances of dying are very low. And it has nothing to do with my character or the world he lives in. If I'm not really afraid of dying, it's because you seldom die in a role-playing game. And it's even more rare after one or two hours of play when you have planned four or five evening sessions in advance. As it is often said in role-playing circles, the Game Master's primary goal is to ensure that everyone has a good time and then, of course, is not going to kill someone in the first lonely cave. I know there are some extremist Game Masters who don't hesitate to kill everyone without any remorse, but it's very rare, and even if it's not written down anywhere, it's an unspoken rule of role-playing, a Game Master is supposed to turn a blind eye to a bad die roll if that's the price to pay to save the unfortunate player's life and everyone else good evening. This is pretty standard and players are aware of it. Now let's look at the symmetrical case in the world of immersion board games. I'm the white knight in the magic realm. We've just spent an hour setting up the game and we're ready to go. I decide to venture into the first cave I come across just to see what happens. And wouldn't you know it, luck or misfortune, I stumble upon the mythical lost city. I'm quickly surrounded by monsters, a dragon slithers into my clearing, I get a bad roll and I'm dead. Game over. My friends will carry on playing and all that's left for me to do is grab a beer and get out the PlayStation. Wow, is this an exceptional case? Not at all. Take a look at my video about a filmed game of Magic Realm and you'll see how pitifully my sorcerer dies in the middle of the game as a result of some little reckless action. And the same kind of tragedy can happen in Gunslinger or High Frontier. Okay, and so what? So that changes everything. When I'm a Magic Realm character and I decide to venture into a lonely cave, I'm scared. I'm really scared. I'm afraid I'm going to die there like an idiot, so I check my gear again and again, I prepare my sword, and I weigh up all the risks before entering that damned cave. In short, I do what a paladin would do in this unforgiving world. I embody my role, and I'm fully inside the magic circle in a way I've never been in a role-playing game like Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons. To put it another way, the rules of a board game are like the physical rules of a real world. And reality is more believable when it's not blurry. Blurriness is a necessary part of role-playing rules, because these rules have to be flexible to deal with all kinds of unexpected situations. And then, in a paradoxical way, you end up with fairly generic and abstract systems like the D20 system with its skill rolls and critical results. Systems that have to be constantly adapted to the game situation. So corners are cut, edges are planed, and all the rules always remain negotiable. In an immersion board game, it's quite the opposite. The rules are set in stone, with no room for negotiation. The result is a more restricted game world with a tighter perimeter where you cannot just do anything, but what you do, you do with incomparable realism. When I'm the white knight in the magic realm, I'm facing the reality of the terrible dragon. 
alone with no blur to allow me to skew or negotiate, no game master to save the day, and that's what makes me truly afraid in the face of danger. Second example, I call this one the amateur syndrome. Let's say I'm playing Call of Cthulhu, the famous role-playing game from Chaosium. After spending hours exploring, my group of adventurers find themselves in a hidden temple deep in the Venezuelan jungle. To their horror, they meet a frightening entity, a giant insectoid creature with a vaguely human form and covered in fur. Luckily, my character, Astrid, a librarian specializing in the occult, knows a thing or two about things that aren't supposed to exist. So I ask aloud if this beast reminds me of anything, and the game master tells me to make a skill roll in Cthulhu Mythos. I roll the die, and bam, I get exceptional success. The game master tells me that I know these creatures quite well, having read about it in my books. It's a dimensional wanderer with the ability to retreat at will into unfathomable dimensions. I also know that when it uses this power, just before it disappears, the monster comes to rest in some vibratory tremor and that's when it's most vulnerable. Knowing that, my friend Gunther shuts it down with a burst from his tommy gun right in the middle of a vibratory tremor. Ratata, victory, we've killed the dimensional wanderer. Okay, and what's wrong with that? Well, looking back, I'm not too happy with my performance. As Astrid, I'm a very knowledgeable person and I drew on my science for that little detail that enabled us to defeat the monster. But the truth is I didn't do it myself. It was a roll of the Cthulhu Mythos skill. Then the game master whispered the solution in my ear. Take advantage of the vibratory tremor. Yes, I play a specialist, but the truth is I'm just an amateur. In an immersion board game, it's not like that. Take Station Fall. It's my turn to play, my character is the troubleshooter, fine. The situation isn't exactly rosy. My sworn enemy, the colonel, you recognize him by his military medal, is in the security station where he's just programmed the robotic assassin. At the end of the turn, it will come and kill me. The robotic assassin is some kind of AI that automatically attacks the character its target is pointing at. Anyway, I'm in a bind and I'm thinking. The botanist over there in the kitchen is my ally. To put it simply, in this game, each character can perform two actions. As the botanist is armed with a gun, he could come and join me with his two actions. Then, I can pay him with my Bitcoin to ask for a third action. Bitcoin gives a wild action, it represents the power of money. With this third action, the botanist shoots his gun and kills the robotic assassin. And that's pretty good, but it doesn't save me because the colonel can shoot me right after because he's armed too. Bang! I manage to escape from one only to be killed by the other. I'm pretty much done for at this point and I'm starting to despair. But then I've got a great idea. Check it out and freeze frame if you're having trouble following. I activate my ally, the botanist. But I remember that since I'm the troubleshooter, all my allies are able to move through the air vents the dotted yellow lines on the map. So the botanist can sneak up to the reactor. And then he destroys the reactor by firing his gun at the control console. So as a result, the electricity produced by the reactor flickers and the station automatically goes into safety mode. In other words, the station switches off all superfluous equipment and in particular the jammers that normally block communications. Then I spend my bitcoin not on the botanist but on activating the exile 
who has nothing to do with our business and is resting in the therapy garden. But I do this because I know the exile is a hacker. So in exchange for my Bitcoin, I ask him to hack and reprogram the robotic assassin and change its target to the colonel, which he can only do thanks to the botanist who has just cut the jammers by destroying the reactor. Do you see the infernal cabal? End of the turn, the robotic assassin advances towards its new target and kills the colonel. Problem solved, I'm off the hook. Okay, this example was a bit long, but did you see the difference? In an immersion board game like Station Fall, you have to learn the rules before you play. The robotic assassin, the bitcoin, hacking with the exile, These are all rules that players have had to learn. And so the result is that this magnificent reasoning I've just done and which killed the colonel, well, I did it myself. Whether I'm the player or the troubleshooter on the space station, it's all the same because the identification is perfect. Nobody else came up with the brilliant idea for me after some ship knowledge skill roll And I can guarantee you that in terms of adrenaline rush and explosion of joy, there's no comparison. When you achieve this kind of feat in an immersion board game, you remember it for 20 years. In a role-playing game, you're often an amateur playing the role of a specialist. In an immersion board game, you have to go through hours of rules. Yes, it's hard work and it's an investment, But at the end of the day, you really do become a specialist in the world you're living in. And in terms of character identification, there's no comparison. Third example. This time, let's think about who is the author of the story we are living. Whether you're playing an immersion game or a role-playing game, in both cases, what you're looking for is an adventure. A fictional adventure. So, events that never really happened, but we enjoy making ourselves believe that they are real and that we really lived them. But if these events are made up, then someone must have invented them. But who then? Who is the author of the story I'm living? Oh lolo, it's getting philosophical, isn't it? You're asking yourself a lot of questions, Jean-Michel. Who is the author? What does it matter? Well, in fact, it's important. It's important for immersion. What I want is to be fully immersed in a story, in a world, in a character. I want to feel like I'm there. So, if I realize that the story I'm living has been invented by X or Y, I lose a little faith. And even worse, I can come to think that this author, X or Y, has probably already invented the end of the story I'm living, or the various possible endings. Then I feel even less free and I start to lose faith in reality. Well, I'll give you this, it's a bit subtle, so let's move on to the example. In a role-playing game, especially the most modern ones, everyone takes part in creating the universe and the story that unfolds. Yes, there's a game master, but he's not the only author. And we try, all together, to move forward as musicians would in a jazz improvisation. We give ourselves a harmonic bass, a standard, and then each one adds to it according to his sensitivity. We know where we are starting from, but we don't know how far we are going to go. Fine, it looks great, but in practice, I have a problem with it. Let's suppose I'm playing Pathfinder, and the game master asks me the dreadful question, what are you doing? Okay, it's up to me to improvise, so I gather all the elements I have, I've got all the details about the world provided by the game master, a clearing in a lost forest with a murdered elf, and that's all very well, but what can I do in such a situation? I look at my personal character sheet, I look at the player's manual, and I find some lists, 
skills, spells, equipment, so I use my creativity to try and move things along. I can cast the spell Talk to Plants, so I ask the Game Master if there is some tree around there. The Game Master pauses, then he says, yes, there's an old oak tree. Fine, so I ask this old oak tree if it has witnessed anything. The Game Master thinks this is a great idea, so he seizes it and moves on. He adds that the oak is very old and that I don't quite understand his gibberish, but that finally I get two or three useful pieces of information. That's the basic idea. I'm oversimplifying here a bit, but that's basically how a role-playing game works. We pass the creative ball back and forth, and like a jazz improvisation, we gradually build an engaging adventure. Well, it's perfect, isn't it? What can be wrong with it? What bothers me is that, by going this route, you end up making the players, and that includes the Game Master, the authors of their own story. So, when something happens, it comes out of the head of one of the players around the table, and it gives the impression that nothing exists outside the player's will. It's like the philosopher's famous quote, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make any sound? Translated to the world of role-playing, does the world we are simulating exist independently of the player's imagination? And the old oak tree I questioned with my spell still gives me the impression that it only exists because a player had the idea of asking it a question. By way of comparison, let's take the example of an immersion game. I'm playing Cryavoc as Lord Gaston, trying to defend his castle against the onslaught of Lombard soldiers. It's a critical moment, ladders are piling up along the walls, I'm trying to organize my defense while waiting for reinforcements. Two men bring a basin of boiling oil. But the pot is heavy and cumbersome, and they've wasted time getting into position. While waiting for them to take a position, I ask a crossbowman posted on the main tower to fire on the first attackers. The brave Egbert, please don't laugh at his name, adjusts his bolt with a trembling hand. You have to put yourself in his shoes, it's a stressful situation. And he shoots. I'll spare you the technical details because there are rules to the game. Anyway, he rolls the dice, he misses, and the rules tell us he has to hit an adjacent space. He throws a 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and unfortunately, it lands on Tom's space. Tom is a brave worker who doesn't have time to figure out what's happening. A crossbow bolt fired by a friend hits him in the back, he loses consciousness, he drops his side of the basin, the flaming oil spreads over the ramparts and below, Gaston on his horse screams under his scalded armor, it's a catastrophe, damn Egbert, wait till you get down from that tower before I strangle you with my own hands. And that's the kind of scene I love when I'm playing an immersion game, because afterwards, if I ask myself who came up with this story, the answer is nobody. Nobody around the table, not even the game's designer. What happened was the result of a combination of circumstances. The result of the player's decisions, but also a bit of chance and a blend of the incredible richness of all the Cryavoc rules. Some might say I'm nitpicking and that this scene could have taken place in a role-playing game, but I say no. In a role-playing game, the Game Master would have had the idea that Egbert's missed shot could cause the pot of boiling oil to fall. He would have estimated the odds and rolled a die, or he would have triggered the result just because he thought it was funny and his goal is to make everyone have fun. Inevitably, that would have left me with the feeling that it was all a bit arbitrary. Not real, just somebody's ID. In Cryavoc, 
the pot spills and nobody saw it coming and there's nothing anyone can do about it and that's how you feel totally immersed because it's really like reality. Fine, I hope you like it, but uh, the clock is ticking, so let's introduce our fourth and final example. This time I'm going to focus on the role-playing game scope. It's generally said that this is the great advantage of role-playing games. Their scope is infinite. You can do anything in a role-playing game, you can simulate anything. And then comes the moment in a Call of Cthulhu game, for example, when there's going to be a car chase or in a Shadowrun game, a battle with drones. And then there are two main options. Either you cope with a blurry and quite abstract view of the scene, or you put some minis on the table and define some rules to manage the situation. These include how much you can accelerate or break, in which arc of fire the drones can shoot, how you determine if there's a collision, and so on. And then, you see my point, your role-playing game begins to feel like a board game. I think role-playing games are great for telling stories where you play characters, mainly on foot, solving investigations. There can be a bit of action or fight, but it's limited to less than a dozen people. And when we want to tell a different kind of story, we are stuck. Let's say I just saw Mad Max in the theater, and I'd love to relive it in my living room. Frankly, I'd rather do it with Car Wars or Gaslands than with any role-playing game, because what you want in Mad Max is a convoy attack with motorcycles, trucks, and cars jumping around. Just because I want to play a role doesn't mean that role-playing game is the best tool for the job. What if I want to be an airplane pilot, a spaceship pilot, a cowboy, or Napoleon? In all these cases, immersion games seem more appropriate. And it's not a matter of theme or reserved domain. Take a look at the skirmish rule in Pathfinder, or the recent Dungeons and Dragons Onslaught. As soon as you want to go into detail and break down an action with cinematic precision, there's no room for blurriness. You need rules that are straightforward, you need immersion games. Okay, I'll wrap up for today, and I hope these four examples have piqued your interest in immersion board games. Games that can tell stories like no other medium can. And also, I just wanted to reiterate what I said at the beginning. I've shown you four examples where I think board games are more credible than role-playing games. But in other areas, role-playing games win the day. For example, if your thing is to live out a saga, to follow a character for months or years, to see him evolve, improve, or simply change, well, only role-playing games can do that. And if your friends are afraid of endless rules, role-playing game is a great way to get them around the table anyway. Role-playing is a fun way to have adventures without the headache. Just pretending you are a barbarian with muscles or a clever occultist. And the same goes if your game master has a flourishing imagination. If he has invented a universe and unforgettable adventures, why not trust him and let yourself be immersed in his story? And finally, if you love investigations, infiltration, espionage or diplomacy, there's no better way to experience these kinds of stories than in a role-playing game. To sum it up, I didn't set out to destroy role-playing games. What I wanted to do was to challenge the idea that role-playing is the gold standard for engaging narrative. It's not, and I hope that after watching my video, you're starting to think about other ways of escaping into imaginary worlds. There are many dimensions in the gaming universe, there are many thrones in the gaming pantheon, and in our dreamer's heart, there's a place for immersion games.